Our text for this morning revolves around one word found in Galatians 5, and 23. There Paul writes, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. And then comes this one word we want to look at this morning, faithfulness, faithfulness. And some time ago, my oldest daughter gave me some terrific insight on motherhood. Her instructions came in the form of a word game. She gave me a word and then asked me to define it. I score rather well on the Reader's Digest word games, but I flunked her test miserably. For you see, the definition she was looking for came not from Webster's Dictionary, but from a mother's dictionary. Here's what I learned, and I think you'll agree, her definitions are superb. Dumb waiter. A waiter who asks if your kids would care to order dessert. (laughs) Full name. What you call your children when you're mad at them. Grandparents. People who think your children are wonderful, even though you're not raising them right. Independent. How you want your children to be provided they do everything you say. Show off a child more talented than yours. Sterilize what you do to your baby's first pacifier by boiling it. And then to your last baby's pacifier by blowing on it. Here's the last one, weekend. When dad gets to play golf. While mom catches up on laundry, cleans the house, runs errands, etc., etc. If I had to pick one word to describe motherhood, I'd pick the word faithfulness. Mothers tend to be the steadiest, most trustworthy, and reliable people on planet Earth. They not only experience morning sickness, they undergo all kinds of physiological changes during pregnancy. In the last weeks before delivery, they can't even tie their shoes. And during the birthing process, they encounter severe pains. Then following the birth of their babies, they rise in the middle of the night without complaining to feed and change these little ones. Mothers personify faithfulness. In Isaiah 49, 15, God asks, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is clearly intended to be no. Why, of course not. Such a thing is unthinkable. Nevertheless, I sense a pause in the text of Isaiah. Though the thought itself is unthinkable and certainly incomprehensible, some mothers do abandon their children. Then come these wonderful words from God the Father. Though your mother may forget you, I will never forget you. This morning I want to begin by sharing with you a model for faithfulness. Believe me, it's not mothers, it's God. I call God the faithful gardener. That gardener who aims to produce in us his garden, the kind of faithfulness that reflects his character and conduct. So let's look at God, the faithful gardener, as we begin. First, some observations about God's faithfulness. Consider for a moment the Bible's teaching on faithfulness. Faithfulness is expressed both in the Old Testament and the New. Just two texts from the Old Testament. Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. I am the Lord, I am the Lord, the merciful and gracious God. I am slow to anger and rich in unfailing love and faithfulness. Martin Luther named this verse the sermon on the name. For the name Lord, Yahweh in the Hebrew, expresses all that God is and does. So we read, God is rich in unfailing love and faithfulness. Or listen to these words from Psalm 89. O Lord God Almighty, who is like you, 
The implied answer is no one. Why? Because as the psalmist says, you are mighty, O Lord, and faithfulness surrounds you. That is, it permeates the whole of your being. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness goes before you. The same is true in the New Testament. God is faithful. In his book, The Practice of Godliness, Jerry Bridges summarizes the faithfulness of God in the New Testament. I quote, We are dependent upon God's faithfulness, he writes, for our final salvation, 1 Corinthians 1, for deliverance from temptation, 1 Corinthians 10, for ultimate sanctification, that is our growth toward Christ's likeness, 1 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians 5, for the forgiveness of sins, 1 John 1, for deliverance through times of suffering, 1 Peter 4, and for the fulfillment of our ultimate hope of eternal life, Hebrews 10. Bridges concludes, God's faithfulness appears in precept or illustration on almost every page of the Bible. It is impossible to describe the acts of God without in some way touching upon his faithfulness. The God we worship is characterized by faithfulness. But now let me try to define faithfulness as it's rooted in the faithfulness of God. Three simple truths. First, for a person to be faithful, they must first speak the truth. Our God always speaks the truth. Look at Revelation 21.5. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write down these words, for they are trustworthy and true. In a court of law, faithful witness promises under oath, to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help them God. When a witness under oath fails to tell the truth, they perjure themselves. When God claims that his words are trustworthy, what he means is that he always tells the truth. He never perjures himself. Faithful people speak the truth because a faithful God speaks the truth. Second, for a person to be faithful, they must do what is right. Our God always does what is right. Look at Deuteronomy 32.4. God's works are perfect, and all his ways are just. Faithful, A faithful God who does no wrong, upright and just is he. If as a paper boy I skip your casita and condo every Monday and Thursday, am I a faithful paper boy? If I call into work sick when I'm really looking to take a day off, am I a faithful employee? If I skip a couple of mortgage payments every year, am I a faithful mortgage holder? If I cheat on my spouse, am I a faithful husband? No. For a person to be faithful, they must do what is right. Because God always does what is right, he is faithful. Third, for a person to be faithful, they must keep their promises. Our God always keeps his promises. Look at Psalm 145, verse 13. The Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving toward all he has made. Like God, faithful people are promise keepers, not promise breakers. They honor the commitments they have made. Now, when you look at God, there's no doubting his faithfulness. He speaks the truth. He does what is right, and he always keeps his promises. In the moments remaining, I want to turn from God, the faithful gardener, to us, the fruitful garden, which, in which he is doing his cultivating work. What does this spirit fruit called faithfulness look like? in our lives. I want to set before you four things that reflect this fruit of the Spirit called faithfulness. Here's the first. Faithful people embrace God's promises and patiently wait for their fulfillment. 
Faithful people embrace God's promises and patiently wait for their fulfillment. In Hebrews 11, we have what many call the Hall of Faith. Here, over and over again, we read the words, by faith, by faith. Then towards the end of the chapter, the author sums up this great Hall of Faith with these words, verses 32 to 39. What more shall I say? I do not have the time to tell you about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, shut the mouths of lions, and escaped the edge of the sword. Note, these saints all believed God, and God did remarkable things through them. Others, our text continues, verse 35, were tortured. Some faced jeers and flocking, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, sawn in two, put to death by the sword. Then the writer makes this sweeping assertion in verse 39. These were all commended for their faith or for their faithfulness. All of them, the knowns and the unknowns, the famous and the infamous, those who triumphed in victory, as well as those who persevered in suffering. Verse 39, these were all commended for their faith or faithfulness, yet none of them received what they were promised. None of them saw the coming of the Messiah promised in the Old Testament. They all entered heaven with this one great promise unfulfilled. That, my friends, is the spirit fruit called faithfulness. Faithful people embrace the promises of God and patiently wait for their fulfillment. Let's be honest, waiting for the fulfillment of God's promises is not always easy. On June 23, 1948, God did not spare my father's life. He was at work checking the back of a bus owned by the Seattle Transit System, when another bus, his brakes gave way coming down the ramp, and my father was caught between the two buses. What was it that sustained our family in the days immediately following his death? There were many things. First, Dad suffered little. Second, he was in heaven. Third, he left a phenomenal legacy of love and good deeds. But the most important thing that sustained us during those days was my mother's faith and faithfulness. Beneath all the unanswered questions and the pain we were experiencing was her simple confidence that God was in control and that his promises were sure. She believed and taught us to believe that God works all things together for good, our good and his good. She believed and taught us to believe that a glorious day is coming when God will wipe away all tears from our eyes, when there will be no more death or mourning or pain, for the old order of things will have passed away. She believed and taught us to believe that God's promises are sure, and that in the end, our waiting will be rewarded. Faithful people embrace the promises of God and patiently wait for their fulfillment. Second, faithful people regard God's sacred revelation as a trust and refuse to tamper with it. I suffered a heart attack in January of 2007, eight days into an interim pastorate in a church in Michigan. What you do not know is how my cardiologist described me to his colleagues. Because I carried a record of his analysis, diagnosis, back to my family doctor, I simply opened it up to see what he said about the patient. This is what he said. The patient is a moderately obese male. <laughs> not particularly flattering, is it? I mean, frankly, the truth hurts. He could have said the patient is slightly overweight. He could have said the patient is a bit on the husky side. 
Or he could have said, the patient carries his weight well. He said none of these things. He regarded his professional analysis as the truth. And he was not about to let me rewrite what he had written. Likewise, faithful people don't tamper with the Bible. They don't call evil good and good evil. They don't affirm the morality of same-sex marriage. And then mock those who adhere to sexual abstinence before marriage. They don't celebrate Jesus' command to love your neighbor as yourself. And then deny his exclusive claims to be the truth, the way, and the life. Rather, they submit themselves to the Bible's authority and let its truth penetrate their lives. They make it their aim to be faithful to the Bible, to hear what it says, and then to do what it says. John celebrates these kinds of people when he writes in his third epistle. It gave me great joy to have some brothers come and tell me about your faithfulness to the truth and how you continue to walk in the truth. Faithful people regard God's revelation as a sacred truth and refuse to tamper with it. Third, faithful people honor the commitments they have made even when life is tough. Proverbs 3 reads, Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Fifty-three years ago this May, I stood at the altar and made a lifelong commitment to my wife, Sharon. I promised to love her, to be faithful to her, in health and in sickness, in joy and in sorrow, in prosperity and adversity. I admit I had no idea at the time what I was promising. I don't know what would have happened had Sharon become a quadriplegic in the first two weeks of our marriage. It might not have lasted. Oh, I know I promised on that day that I would never leave her or forsake her regardless of the circumstances. But I must confess that my love was lustful at the time and quite self-serving. Over the years, however, I've come to discover the meaning of covenant love expressed via commitment. You see, in marriages that last, people don't simply keep their vows. Their vows keep them. And so today I know that if Sharon were to become a quadriplegic tomorrow, I'd take care of her for the rest of my life. You see, faithful people honor the commitments they have made, even when life is tough. Now finally, faithful people are captivated by God's glory and value it more highly than life itself. Paul was certainly a man captivated by God's glory. In the last letter he ever penned, knowing that death was just around the corner, he wrote these magnificent words found in 1 Timothy 4. I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. Now note the words. I have kept the faith. That is, I have been found faithful. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. For the Apostle Paul, faithfulness was motivated by a passion for God's glory that transcended even life itself. And John, in the closing book of the Revelation, encourages Christ followers to be captivated by that same glory. Listen to these words in Revelation 2.10. Do not be afraid of what you're about to suffer. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. 
Echoes of these two texts were played out in Littleton, Colorado, some 18 years ago. There at Columbine High School in the spring of 1995, 1999, 15 youth lost their lives. Among those 15 students are stories of incredible courage and faithfulness. Eyewitnesses said Rachel Scott received four gunshot wounds. Just before firing the final shot, the gunman said, Do you believe in God? Then pulling the trigger, he said, Then go join him. Among the other martyrs was Cassie Burnell, who went looking down the barrel of a gun and into the eyes of the killer was asked herself, Do you believe in God? Without hesitation, she responded, Yes. With that bold confession, she was shot and killed. Following her death, Cassie's mother and father said, Our prayer is that her yes will be proclaimed aloud by many more to come. And believe me, they have been. Today, Christian Solidarity International estimates that more than 150 Christ followers are martyred every year around the world, and that nearly two-thirds of the world's population live in areas that are hostile to the Christian faith. For those of us who live in the West, it's important to remember that although prosperity has sometimes been fatal to the Christian faith, persecution seldom has. Do you know why? It's because faithful people are captivated by God's glory and value it more highly than life itself. In closing this morning, I want to share with you a personal experience where my passion for God's glory and this spirit fruit called faithfulness was both severely tested and graciously cultivated. I retired from Walnut Hill Community Church in Bethel, Connecticut in June of 2005 and was named Pastor Emeritus. That August, I signed on for a one-year stint as an interim pastor in a church in the South. We made friends quickly in this new setting, and in just a few months had captured the minds and hearts of that congregation. Then four months into that assignment, that church found their new senior pastor. Mind you, he was a wonderful young man with significant gifts. And both Sharon and I welcomed him into the church. But what I discovered about myself was this. After 40 years of being the front man, it was not easy to be marginalized or pushed aside. From the moment the new senior pastor came, I was not asked to participate in any of the weekend services, not even to lead in prayer. On Christmas Eve, I find myself moving chairs to accommodate the crowd rather than serving communion to celebrate Christ's birth. In February, the senior pastor invited a local psychologist to speak to give him a breathing spell from preaching every week. That action wounded me deeply. Here I was faithfully fulfilling the responsibilities that had been entrusted to me. And yet I was no longer welcome in the pulpit. When I carefronted our new pastor about this, I discovered that he had been instructed by the elders not to put me in any upfront spot, but to marginalize me. Because Sharon and I were so loved by the people that we would make his transition difficult. I must tell you, I felt like a pariah. I had no intention of doing anything in this church other than accomplishing a smooth and seamless transition for the new senior pastor. These were not easy days for me. On the other hand, I must tell you they were important days. For God was teaching me a very significant lesson. During those days, as I walked and prayed the campus where we lived, I said, Lord, what are you doing? What do you want from me? What can I learn from this experience? And do you know what happened? 
God answered those prayers. I'd been teaching an Old Testament survey class to a small group on Wednesday evening. And in studying the life of Moses, came upon his forced flight from Egypt to the backside of the desert. Here was a man raised for the first 40 years of his life in King Pharaoh's household, perhaps with a PhD in political science from the University of Alexandria, and a future that no Jew could even begin to comprehend. And where do we find him for the next 40 years of his life? On the backside of a desert, tending sheep. Dreaming about what might have been. As I reviewed Moses' life, here's what God said to me. Joel, obscurity is the way to humility. Obscurity is the way to humility. Furthermore, it is the test of faithfulness. And how you handle this experience will reveal the kind of person you really are. Hear me carefully this morning. God is not looking for influential people he can make faithful. God is looking for faithful people he can make influential. I repeat, God is not looking for influential people or he can make faithful. God is looking for faithful people he can make influential. And make no mistake, faithfulness is the work of the Holy Spirit. So I pray for you and for me on this New Year's Day. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Melt us, mold us, fill us, use us. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. Amen.